Welcome to the Immigration.ca live stream series. We'd just like to apologize, we are a couple minutes late due to some Facebook technical problems. Today we've, we've decided to dedicate our session to answering your questions. So my name is Andrea, and I'm here with immigration lawyer Colin Singer. Colin is managing partner of Immigration.ca. During our last live stream, we asked you to leave your questions in the discussion forum part of our website, Immigration.ca. We selected some of your questions, and attorney Colin Singer will be answering them today. Well, Colin, should we start with the questions? Let's do that. Okay. So the first question is, my current permit expires in early February 2017. I've received a new LMIA with another employer and plan to apply for a new work permit. Am I required to leave Canada by the expiry date, or can I stay in Canada when my permit expires? Okay. The main point on this particular question is that individuals uh, who are temporarily working in Canada and are nearing the end of their work permit status, uh, when they're going into a renewal process, they have what's called implied status. And you have implied status until a decision is rendered on your renewing application. It's important, however, to remember you need to submit an application prior to the expiry of your work permit. Along with the application, you're going to submit a new, the new LMIA, and the employer is going to uh, pay for the processing fee that goes with that, which uh, uh, you already done. So uh, with the LMIA, you'll submit the application uh, with the uh, supporting documentation, either online, or you can do that uh, inside Canada uh, by post. Uh, now, you've mentioned that you're starting with a new employer. It's important to understand that you're not allowed to start working for the new employer until a decision is rendered on your application. If you were working for the same employer, you would be able to continue working uh, for that employer without waiting for, the new for a new decision on the application. Under both situations, either new employer or continuing employer, uh, you do not have to leave Canada assuming you've made that application prior to the expiry of the work permit. Perfect. Thank you. And the next question, so this actually is a question we get asked very often, and it is, how can I apply as a provincial nominee? We uh, often are faced with uh, choices to be made for applicants coming to Canada. Remember that the biggest uh, uh, application, the biggest category of applications is the express entry system. Now, the express entry system comprises of just four uh, categories. If you're applying under one of those categories, <clears throat> which includes a provincial program, the provincial program itself under express entry has to have certain sub-programs that are part of the express entry system. So if you're looking to be part of the express entry system, you would have to qualify under the provincial program that is linked to the express entry system. You would go ahead and apply, and once you have approval, uh, that would all be done online, and you're creating an express entry profile, which would be joined up with your express entry approval from the province. Uh, you can check our website and we'll, we, dis, we distinguish these, these variances. There are a number of programs <clears throat> in the provinces that are not part of the express entry system. So in that instance, you're applying uh, through the provincial program by paper. Uh, you're qualifying generally the, the position uh, doesn't meet the express entry system. Uh, it has to have a high, higher level, a higher rank, and we cover all that on our website. So we often uh, encourage people to go ahead and, if you're looking at an express entry type provincial program, submit your profile to the federal express entry system, and then afterwards you'll join up the provincial uh, approval, the nomination. Uh, again, if you're not applying under the express entry system of a province, then you would be dealing directly with the province, and then uh, you would apply for permanent residence outside the express entry system once you have the provincial nomination. Bear in mind, if you're applying for a provincial program that's not part of the express entry system, these programs open and close very quickly. Uh, they are uh, quota-based. Uh, the provinces have certain allocations each year. And so you need to be really informed and up-to-date. And more importantly, your application has to be ready to go as soon as a program is open. So uh, we uh, encourage people to keep abreast of these types of programs that open and close very quickly so that you won't be faced with a program being overfilled by the time you submit your application. But that's generally the strategy involved uh, in a provincial program. Again, Quebec is quite different. They have their own 
uh, rules and their own powers, which are significantly different, uh, we'll say, than a provincial nomination program. And again, we cover, of course, uh, we cover uh, the Quebec program on our website uh, in quite detail. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Colin. The next question, this person's in a common law relationship. They want to know, how can my common law partner and I prove that we've been together for 12 months? Well, the first uh, part of an application of this nature uh, is that you're going to submit a statutory declaration. You have to have a formal legal document uh, that, is, that is confirming the common law union. Now, once you, that is the initiating document that, that, that you build from. Uh, you will add to that document uh, an array of possibilities. Uh, you're basically trying to show evidence that's objective, uh, that indicates that you have a relationship together, of course, dating back uh, for the period of 12 months in question. Uh, that could be anywhere from uh, utility bills, it could be um, a property that's in joint uh, name, it could be uh, insurances. Uh, it's quite open, uh, and really you, you don't have to submit all of these documents, but it's, it generally we try to uh, include a nice number of documentation that will show and confirm objectively that the two individuals have a life together and have been cohabitating uh, in a common law relationship. Um, and, and cohabitation, by the way, is not in itself a, a requirement. It's, it's uh, one way that's done. Uh, but what you don't want, of course, do, and, and immigration authorities don't like this, is when you submit uh, CD-ROMs and uh, photo books and things like that. So uh, stay away from that. Uh, but uh, a good consultation on that could help you, uh, but it may not be necessary depending on your, your uh, uh, approach to putting together a full application of this type. Perfect. Thank you. So the next question, this person is, so it's a parental sponsor, spo sponsorship application. So they want to know what are the consequences of the sponsor and co-sponsor of the two foreign nationals, parents, agreeing to divorce prior to the arrival of two foreigners in the country? So the two foreign nationals have already been approved for PR. They want to know if the visa can be jeopardized due to the change in the sponsor's marital status. The main sponsor makes over $65,000 a year. Well, you've mentioned, the individuals mentioned that the permanent residence application has already been approved. Uh, so it means that the, uh, likely the, the visas have already been put into the passports and returned to the individuals. Uh, the important legal obligation here is that co-sponsors uh, uh, are going to be both liable uh, for the uh, financial obligations uh, that go for a 10-year period. Now, if the marriage is breaking down or breaks down after all of this has uh, been finalized, unfortunately, the main uh, sponsor is, is going to be fully responsible for that obligation. So uh, it's a question of uh, when the marriage breaks down and uh, the obligations, unfortunately, this individual, you mentioned $65,000, I don't think it sounds to be a problem. It could be a problem if, for example, the individual uh, main sponsor does not have the required income and needs the co-sponsor's uh, annual income to qualify for, for that uh, undertaking. In that instance, unfortunately, the uh, application would not be able to succeed uh, but uh, you've mentioned uh, in, in, in passing that the permanent residence application has already been approved. In this instance, you have the income. Unfortunately, the main applicant, uh, the main sponsor, I should say, uh, is going to be fully liable for that 10-year commitment in this situation. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So the next question. So basically, they want to know if you can get access to a previously approved and completed application submitted to the government. So this person is doing their citizenship application, and last year they did a PR renewal application. So they want to know if they included one of their previous addresses in the application. So they, they only lived in that previous address for a year or so, and they didn't even get mail there. They had a mailing address at a different address, so that was their husband's parents' address. They just can't remember what they put on their previous application. They don't want there to be any discrepancy because they don't want their application to be rejected. Right. Well, that's, that's a reasonable uh, concern. The first way to go about this is to apply for an access to information request. It's a $5 fee. You submit the application uh, to the uh, access to information office and generally within 30 days or so, 
you can expect to receive and, and be very precise in what you're looking for. You're looking for the complete application when you submitted it, uh, what you're looking for. Now, it does occur sometimes that these take time to process and they, they go far beyond the 30 days. If time becomes a concern for you and, for example, you're concerned about meeting the citizenship residence requirements and time is moving on or for other reasons you need to get this done, uh, you could go ahead without submitting an access to information. Simply put the explanation of the discrepancy in addresses mentioned on a separate sheet of paper with the application why you're concerned that you identify the two possible addresses that you would have used uh, on the previous application and you would identify uh, what those addresses are and the reasons why you're concerned that you lived with a parental uh, family and you're not sure which address you mentioned in a previous application. So I think by coming clean and being fully uh, transparent about this possible discrepancy, you should be, uh, you should be covering your bases. Perfect. Thanks. So the next question, this is a very specific question. This person is in the process of renewing their PRC, and this is for the second time. It's a very specific application form question. So it's regarding form IMM 5444. It's uh, with regards to Section C mostly, questions 19, 20, and 21. Okay. Well, look, uh, in a general sense, without going into the specifics of, of an application, generally when you're trying to prove that you meet the physical residence rule of two years being physically present in Canada in the previous five years. We like to uh, encourage all our clients, you need to keep a file. It's a running, it's a running calendar. Uh, Any time you are at a particular point in time, since you've become a Canadian permanent resident, you need to go back five years from that date, from your date of application, when you're going to submit a new application for a permanent resident card. And you need to be able to answer positively and affirmatively have you been physically present in Canada for two years in five years? Now, you want the burden of proof is on the applicant. So you do want to have evidence. You want to keep evidence in hand. You want to document if you've been flying, you've been boarding flights, you want to keep your boarding passes. You want to keep hotel receipts. You want to keep all your passport stamps. You want to make this evidence readily available so that when you have to prove and the burden of proof is on the applicant, you'll be able to discharge those uh, requirements. Uh, of course, it's up to the officer making a decision, and if the proof is not compelling and the decision comes out that's unfavorable, the permanent resident or one who might uh, be considered no longer a permanent resident okay. always has a right of appeal. Uh, but we always encourage people, it's a, it's a bit of a hassle, but it's, it's easy to access if you, in, in today's day and age, with cell phones and taking images of your boarding pass. It's, it's, it's well worth the planning uh, to avoid uh, these kinds of concerns in the future. Okay, perfect. So the next question, it's a document-related question. So they want to know, photocopies of what documents must be notarized before submission for PRC renewal? Uh, well, basically, if you're going to uh, submit an application uh, that needs to have notarized documentation, uh, you, you're, you're looking at translations. So first of all, translating documents from English uh, into English or French, you need to have uh, a seal and, and, a, and a, a notarized statement uh, confirming the authenticity of the original document and of the, uh, the status of the translator. Other than that, uh, when you're dealing with these types of applications, you don't want to be submitting originals, but you want to submit certified true copies. Certified true copies are almost uh, considered as, as the same probative value as an original document. So if it's in English or French, uh, there's no issue. It's only when there's a translation required that you uh, need to have something certified. Uh, you need to have uh, an authenticated document uh, so, really, generally, uh, uh, certified documents uh, are, are fine in the sense that uh, uh, certified true copies of important documents can be included. Otherwise, if you're dealing in documents that are not English or not French, then you need uh, an additional confirmation of the status uh, of the person rendering these translations. Okay, perfect. So the next question, so this person, their passport is out for renewal. 
They want to know if it's necessary to include photocopies of all passport pages or just the used stamped pages. Oh, well, I would, we would probably encourage an individual to maintain photocopies of your full passport, including the blank pages, so the officer can see uh, there's no uh, omissions in terms of presenting a full picture uh, of whatever you're trying to prove. Okay. Uh, include your full passport, even the pages that are blank. All right, and this is, we have time for one more question. So this person, they lost their passport about a year ago, and this is when they were outside of Canada. They filed a police report, they got it notarized, they did the procedure, and they applied for a new passport. And then with that new passport, they came back to Canada. So their Canadian PR card will expire in about one month. They're worried about how they can apply for the renewal, uh, I mean, basically how they can renew their PR card while in Canada without their previous passport. They know that CIC is going to require a travel history from the CBSA. They want to know how to provide travel documents. And their wife and son are Canadian citizens. Well, realistically, you're going to need to have an explanation uh, of what happened to your passport. Um, you're going to need a copy of the police report. Uh, you're going to want to provide full disclosure of what... This is an important document. Uh, so by not having it, uh, your previous passport, and it's, it, it's not uncommon for individuals who uh, have not met the residency requirements, for example, uh, suddenly lose their passport and they're, they're, they're applying for new passports, which will try, they're trying to cleanse their history and, and uh, obviate the obligation of proving your residency or whatever else you're trying to prove. So unfortunately, it's going to be left to the discretion of an officer. They're going to ask for additional proof, and it's going to be incumbent upon you to have that proof available. Uh, certainly the, the fact that you've mentioned that you've uh, filed a police report, uh, that may help. Uh, it may uh, put things in good standing. But unfortunately, we see this all the time where individuals are uh, going for new passports. And unfortunately, uh, the, the, the central point is have you uh, met the various requirements, which can only be confirmed by the passport that you've had and that you traveled on. So we uh, unfortunately would encourage this individual uh, to put the best proof that you can together. Uh, and if, unfortunately, a negative decision takes place, you'll have hopefully a right of appeal, depending on the type of application. Great. Well, thank you very much, Colin, for answering some of the questions that we received. If you're interested in assessing your eligibility for Canadian immigration, please go to our website, immigration.ca. On, on our website, we have our free online evaluation form so you can have your eligibility assessed. Um, well, we also help employers, and I would want to put a, a special uh, anecdote to uh, the fact that we provide employers with excellent recruiting services. Uh, we currently run a number of mandates with employers who are looking for foreigners, uh, can't find them locally in the various labor markets. So we put together excellent recruitment programs as well as we handle the immigration side of things through our in-house uh, recruitment agency, Global Recruiters of Montreal, which is part of the Global Recruiters Network uh, out of Chicago, Illinois. Uh, what about uh, social media? So, I mean, please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. Please do like us on Facebook as well. And stay tuned. Uh, uh, by following us, you'll find out when our next live stream will be. Great. Uh, probably in early February. I think we're uh, going to wait for some great developments, which we know are taking place, uh, which we expect to take place in the next uh, short while. So I think we're going to run our next live stream uh, sometime uh, during the first 10 days or so of February. So thanks, everyone, for joining us Thank today. Thank you very much. And, and we'll see you in the next live stream. Thanks so much. Thank you.